Rabbi Mattis Friedman. It's um, awesome to have you. Thank God it's Tuesday. It's the last Tuesday of the going out year of the year 2020, a year that has been very um, turbulent unpredictable uh mesmerizing i don't know i think every adjective that i can use will fit and apply and it's usually a good idea at the end of the year to uh summarize summarize the events summarize the effect of those events and this is actually what i would love to do with you today is to sort of tally up the outgoing year and to assess how it has affected the world spiritually and philosophically. That's all. That's all. <laughs> and, and for this, you need a whole half hour. <laughs> <clears throat> 2020 is supposed to be the, uh, the measure of perfect vision. <laughs> the one thing we didn't have in 2020 is any vision at all, it seems. It was the year that we saw nothing. We became completely blind. But on the other hand, 2020 means you see very clearly. So both things were happening. Depends on what we want to focus on. Like just this past week, since last Tuesday, has there been anything good on the news? De depends what channels. <laughs> Even the some best channels. Are, some channels are pretty positive. Yes. Yes, but they're That's not on main. But they're not on main channels. Yeah, for sure. It's 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 paradoxical, but what happened for me. In this, in this 10 months or 11 months, is that the definition of life and death changed. And everybody I mention it to seems to agree after thinking about it. In other words, we were forced to rethink the most basic realities of our lives. And we spoke about this, I think, more than once. There's a difference between fact and truth. Fact is a reality and truth is a reality. They're both real. They're both powerful. But they're not the same thing. Facts are reality as it happens to be for whatever reason. The reality is there are people who are very bad. That's very real, and it's not something you can ignore or, or deny or, or try to whitewash. There are bad people. Are people bad? Is that the true nature of a human being? Probably not. So the fact is people are bad. Is that the truth? Is that how the world was created and designed to be? Truth is people are good. Someplace deep down inside. <laughs> That's the truth. The fact does not match. The fact is people are bad. The fact is, Jews belong in Israel, the world should be at peace, people should be able to devote themselves to higher pursuits and not have to worry about being mugged, about being attacked, about being hated, about being uh, bullied. That's the truth. Fact is, not so nice. So both things are real, but the challenge is, as real as the fact is, never worship it. 
don't believe the fact. Just deal with it. People are committing crimes. Deal with it. Don't let that become the truth. So keep your eye on the truth even while you're dealing with the fact. That makes the fact a little more doable. We can survive the fact, no matter how bad it is, knowing that it's only a fact, it's not the truth. And that in the end, the truth has to win. So where there's a conflict between truth and fact, eventually the fact surrenders and the truth wins, because true is true. So fact means reality as it happens to be, truth means the reality as it must be, as it should be. So people are bad, should they be bad? They must be bad? No, <clears throat> they must be good. That's the purpose of creation. So we deal with the fact, but we believe in the truth. The fact is Mashiach is not here. That's a fact. A very painful, real fact. The world is not what it's meant to be. Fact. But is that how it's going to remain? Is that it? End of subject? No, not at all. Because the truth is that Mashiach must come, Mashiach will come, and the world will be what it's meant to be. It's just a question of when, not if. So until Mashiach comes, every time we see the facts surrender to the truth, we call it a miracle. That's the definition of miracle. The definition of miracle is there was a fact, it was a fact for a long time. All of a sudden, it surrendered and the truth prevailed. Whoa, a miracle. Actually, it's not a miracle. The, f <laughs> the fact that the fact can contradict the truth, that's a miracle. That makes no sense at all. But that the, the truth wins in the end and the fact surrenders, of course. So a person is seriously ill, God forbid, and recovers. Miracle. Miracle cure. Miracle recovery. The fact is that he was not well. The truth is everyone should be well. Nobody should be dying. Nobody should be sick. It's only because they ate from that tree, that lousy apple, probably had a worm in it or a virus or something. <laughs> So death is a fact, it is not true. Death is not necessary. Whoa, that's, that's a change in attitude, right? I mean, that's like rewriting all, all, of, all of reality. Death is not necessary. So the one thing that we could rely on for sure is gone. Right. People always say, there's only one thing that's for sure, death. No, it's not for sure. It's for sure not. <laughs> so, wow, now we got to start from the things we learned before kindergarten and rethink them. So that, that's, to me, that's what happened in 2020. We were forced to rethink the most fundamental facts and the most fundamental truths. And of all the facts and truths, the most fundamental was life and death. So we have a whole new perspective on both. The perspective on life is that it's permanent forever. And the perspective on death is that it's temporary and no longer necessary.
Now we approach life with a whole different enthusiasm, with a whole different commitment. Life is serious because it's forever. It's like uh, Woody Allen many, many years ago when, you know, when he recorded his comedy on a, on a plastic disc called a record and it was played on a record player. <laughs> Long time ago. Anyway, so he makes this joke about how he wasn't getting along with his wife. And uh, to make a long story short, they had to decide whether they're going to go to the Bahamas for the summer or get divorced. <laughs> that was the choice. He decided on the divorce because a month in the Bahamas is over before you know it. A divorce is forever. <laughs> <laughs> so that attitude, you know, marriage, marriage is uh, very, very, very flimsy. It's very frail. It comes, it goes, you get married, you get divorced. But divorce, oh, divorce is like permanent forever. We have respect for the wrong things. Marriage is awesome. Divorce is sad. Life is awesome. Death, it's unnecessary. But unfortunately, we had a lot of it happen this year. And that's what forced us to rethink. The strange deaths of, this, of these 11 months, the, the circumstances, the people who died, the way the whole thing was so mysterious, so un, unusual, unpredictable, and un, not understandable, even, even today. We already have a vaccine for it, but we don't know what it is yet, <laughs> which is also strange. We're curing a disease we don't know. So, yes, it's been, it's been forcing us to rethink everything. In other words, if you ask the emotional impact, what was the emotional impact of both the health condition and the political condition of the world in these last 12 months. Very painful, very confusing, very anxiety-ridden. Very scary. Oh, very scary. All negative, emotionally. But in our heads, something very powerfully good has happened. 2020 vision, we're starting to see right from wrong, good from bad. We're seeing it. It's not a belief anymore. The bad is really bad, and the good is unbelievably good. And that's a positive development. <clears throat> you know, the previous Rebbe back in Russia, when he was a little boy, asked his father, who was the Rebbe at the time, he said, why do we have two eyes? The previous Rebbe was a child. He was just learning his olive base, his alphabet. His father said to him, what is the difference between the letter Shin and the letter Sin? In English, the shin is an S-H, and the letter sin is like the S. So the little boy said, the difference is that the shin has a, a dot on the right side on top, and the sin has a dot on the left side on top. That's how you know which, which letter it is. So his father said to him, the dot on the right side produces a shin, which is a strong sound. The dot on the left side produces a soft, an S, a sin. 
That's the two eyes. You have a right eye and a left eye. The right eye, that's what you use to view your fellow Jew, your friends. The left eye, the sin, that's the eye you look at candies. The previous Rebbe writes in his diary, which he started writing when he was nine years old, he says that answer had such a powerful effect on him. that at that age, five years old, four years old, <clears throat> all of a sudden, his love, the, 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 the size, the magnitude of his love for his fellow Jew was increased, and his interest in candies kind of faded. Now, if you think about the, his father's answer, <clears throat> we have two eyes, one is to look at our friends and the other is to look at candy, really? <laughs> I mean, is that like a make-believe baby answer? <laughs> no. His father was a Rebbe and could not say anything that wasn't 100% true. <clears throat> we have two eyes because that allows us to see three-dimensional. That's physically why. What does it mean to see three-dimensional? It means not only can I see how tall the building is and how wide the building is, I can also see how deep it is. In other words, I can distinguish what's closer to me from what's further away. Depth perception. That comes from having two eyes. Isn't that what the Rebbe's father said to him? You have two eyes so that you can distinguish your friend from a candy. And it's your friend that is close and the candy is far, not the other way around. Your candy doesn't come first, your friend comes first. So, this is the 2020 vision. Our depth perception is becoming much clearer and stronger. We're not as confused about goodness. We're confused about health and politics, which is not terrible because they were never predictable and we never had control. We just thought we did. But good and bad, we have control over and we didn't see it clearly, which is a disaster, a failure as human beings. Having a virus, getting coming down with a virus is not a failure as a human being. But if we don't know right from wrong, if we believe in the, in the fact and ignore the truth, that's a failure as a human being. And that has gotten better, much better, over the past 10 months. <clears throat> and that's why I keep saying the world is getting better. I don't know if it's getting healthier. It's getting better. Better means moral moral improvement, the, the clarity of, of vision concerning moral issues. Who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? It was hard to tell, particularly in politics, because everybody speaks so nicely. They have all these beautiful, wonderful words they use that all sound terrific. Like the, um, <clears throat> the Constitution of the Soviet Union. It sounded better than the American Constitution. <laughs> it sounded so good. Rabbi Friedman, um, you said one of the key things um, at the very, very beginning you said about the separation of good and evil, which is what you are reiterating right now, that it's becoming more and more clear. But there are definitely still good guys in politics as well. However, um, the scary part is, and this is a scary part to me, is that people keep on saying when things go back to normal. 
unfortunately, the normal has been very evil for the longest time. And we got used to it and it became the normal. And for me, the scariest concept is if we're going to go back there. So you said there is a separation. Are we going to see the separation till the end and hopefully soon? <laughs> Seems to be a slow process a little bit. Well, yes, it's, it's terribly slow compared to what we would like to see. <laughs> we want it now. But, it, but it, no, it's, it's going to affect the entire world. In other words, the process will continue until everyone is convinced, till everyone sees it. So the 2020 vision has to happen for everybody. But the moral vision, we have to be able to see morality in 2020 vision. Why that has to happen in 2021? <laughs> you know, because life full of surprises. 2020 happens in 2021. Yeah. But you know, why, why is it that everybody, everybody I, sp I speak to, they're perfectly uh, comfortable and, and convinced that there are going to be surprises, more surprises, but they're all going to be bad. Everybody's comfortable with surprises that are negative. I say, you know, maybe the surprises will be positive. Nah, I don't know. <laughs> Why is it? Why is negative so much more convincing? So much more appealing, exciting? I, I don't know what it is. Everybody's comfortable with, oh yeah, they're going to be surprises. Yeah, this isn't over. There's going to be... How do you know that? Well, yeah. Feels like a it's lot the, more surprises yeah. are coming. <laughs> and they, yeah, right. Because we're so, I don't know, we're so used to it. In, in, different, in, in, in Jewish language, we're used to the fact that we're in Golis. We're not yet used to the fact that we're redeemed from Golis. We are in exile. We've been in exile for 2,000 years. It hasn't been good years. So that's it. Those are our facts. And they are. <laughs> we're not denying how bad the 2,000 years were. But it's just a fact. That's how it happens to be. Remember Did the Germans have to be anti-Semitic? I don't think so. But they were. So did they have to start a world war? They couldn't just fight among themselves a little bit? <laughs> Rabbi Friedman, in Russian, 2020 means, um, like we can say sometimes, prazrenie, which means like awakening. Um, so kind of like a eureka moment. And um, 21 is a target. Achko. So it's kind of like a target. So um, I remember we had one show about the rabbi once with you, and I asked you a question. Uh, how did the rabbi knew everything that he knew? And you said very clearly he knew where to go in his soul to get that information. Well, my observation in the last year that you also possess that very, very special quality where you do know uh, where to go in your soul um, to get that information because, boy, how many times have you been exactly on a target? So I guess I'm going to be asking right now, if it's okay, for you to look into your proper part of the soul to let us know, is Mashiach being revealed to us, the coming of Mashiach? finally being revealed and what can we be expecting in the near future in the year 2021 of course is what I'm asking well one thing I know for sure 
we have to expect the least expected thing. We can't be predictable. You know, you ask people, you ask people what do you expect? And, and you can predict what they expect because they're predictable. It's not out of the box. That's still thinking within the box. This year, we have to be open to the possibilities we never thought were possible. That's called surprise. Most people predict a surprise, but they won't be surprised because they're predictable. So you got to think really, the more out of the box you can think, the closer you're getting to what's going to happen. In other words, what's going to happen are the things we least expect. That's why it's a surprise. Um, looking back at it, 12 months ago, the world as we see it today was unthinkable. Yes, there were people who were talking about a virus that's going to kill a lot of people. And that's a little suspicious. They were not prophets. Hmm. So it was already cooking then, somewhere. The idea was already being bandied around. But the point is, to the average person, the world as we see it today was so unthinkable. And yet here we are. So that's in the negative. In the positive, it should be even more exciting and more unpredictable or less predictable. So that's why we have to rethink the fundamentals, not the details. Get down to the most fundamental things. And that's where all the excitement is going to happen. And then the world has changed forever. When you change the fundamentals, when you change the foundation, nothing is the same anymore. So what I'm hoping for is that everybody will find their path and their, and their uh, ladder to climb, to get to the ultimate purpose for which we were created, and everyone will do what they're supposed to be doing, including me. We'll finally get around to being who we really are. And who we really are, we're going to discover. And it's going to be awesome. Rabbi Friedman, um, a lot of the times during this year, you have spoke about communism and the negative effects that it had on the world. Well, apparently, even though we shouldn't be listening to conspiracy theories, however, we can't tell the conspiracy theories apart from the news anymore. So is it out there? Is it being, you know, uh, made up? I don't know. Um, but let's say whatever is being said right now is the truth that the biggest threat right now is China because of the Communist Party. And... Um, and you have mentioned it so many times, and I'll tell you honestly, in the beginning, I did not understand why we were talking about communism. It's like long gone. Apparently, it's so not. If you listen to yeah, the news, which we shouldn't be listening to. So um, is this threat of communism something that we should be really worried about in the upcoming year? Now, some st a student asked me, why are you still living by the old laws? They were written 3,000 years ago. Isn't it time to uh, upgrade them? <laughs> Bring them up to date? The Ten Commandments, they're old. <laughs> the answer is, if you come up with a new sin, then we'll come up with new commandments. So far, it's the same old sins. So, so the same old laws apply to the same old sins. Which is an amazing thing, by the way. In 3,000 years, imaginative, creative, uh, resourceful people couldn't come up with a new sin. 
We're not as smart as we think we are. <laughs> Can't even think of a new sin. So the same old laws apply because the same old thing. Now, evil is trying to survive, but it can't come up with anything new. So it falls back on, let's see, what was really evil in the past? And they're dredging up the old evils because there's no new one. So we're seeing communism becoming popular and Nazism. All of a sudden, people are painting swastikas all over the place. Swastikas are old. Come up with a new sign, with a new icon. <laughs> no, nope, same old. And when it's, you know, like, like they say, when, when the virus mutates, it's a much weaker version. When evil mutates, the same old evil trying to be resurrected, it's, it's, it's flimsy, it's, it's, <laughs> it's pathetic. Like people walking around saying, I'm a Nazi. You have no idea what a Nazi was. You're not a Nazi, you're an idiot. So, both evils of, of the past uh, century are being dredged up because nobody can come up with anything original. But it seems like it's been cooking for a while. It's not something that just sprung out of nowhere. Apparently, the world has been preparing for this communist takeover um, that is being plotted, if we understand it correctly. But it's not really. It's not really. I don't think China ever had real communism. They're not interested in world dominion. They're not interested in changing the values of people. They just, they just want to control the money. It's more capitalism than, than it looks. <laughs> it's just about money. Original communism was an evil philosophy. I don't think they have an evil philosophy. They're greedy. They're not nice. They don't treat their people nice. Of course. <laughs> but not, not, it's not a philosophical thing. It's, it's what communism turned out to be, not what it started off as. So it doesn't have the backbone. It doesn't have the, the foundation of the evil of, of communism. So if they start losing money, it's all over. Unfortunately, it also seems to be contagious, and um, a lot of uh, people are catching that greed fever, um, and it's spreading. I don't think so. I think young people looking for a little rebellion find it exciting, but again, there's, there's no commitment to it. <clears throat> there's no, there's no uh, idealism behind it. It's a rebellion. It's a good excuse to not listen to the rules. So it's only certain people who are attracted to it. Under communism, the best of the best f fell for it because it sounded so right and so good and so, such a moral advance. And then of course it deteriorated into, into horrors But you don't hear communists, you don't hear Chinese people speaking idealistically about communism. They're just shrewd and, and underhanded and trying to get the most out of it. But in other words, <clears throat> if I had been there in the times when communism was popular, I would have probably respected it. There's no respect for China. They just like to produce inferior products and make a lot of money. <laughs> and the same with Nazism, the rise of Nazism. It's a reinvention of Nazism, which means it's pathetic. But unfortunately, both movements became global. Yeah, that's, that's evil's last attempt. 
And it's like children, like, oh, I'm going to be very bad. I'm going to be like, like the cookie monster. <laughs> Come up with something original. Rabbi Freedom, but how can we not be afraid of it if it penetrated very powerful structures, structures yeah. that affect the world and political makeup of the world and, um, of course, the financial makeup of the world? How can we not worry that, you know, where there's so much power and control that it's still not going to take over? I am worried. And, and it is scary. But what's worrisome and scary is how many, how many scars is it going to leave behind before it finally dies out? But it's going to die out, there's no question about that. Even if nobody does anything. Hopefully good people will do something about it and fight back. So yes, it is it's scary. It's just not something you start to believe in. It's just a fact. <laughs> like the fact is Jews cannot survive in this world. That's been a fact since uh, Egypt, since Moses spoke to Pharaoh. <laughs> it's been a fact that Jews cannot survive. Okay, so it's a fact. But the truth is there can't be a world without Jews. So you got to deal with the fact it's very painful and scary, but you got to believe in the truth so that you can deal with the fact more effectively without succumbing to it. The whole question is, can we participate in fighting it? Yeah, there's certain marches and certain organizations and people are starting to speak out more, which is really, really awesome. And they speak out their values outwardly, which really hasn't been happening in the longest time. Um, however, the scary part is, Rabbi Friedman, we have 219 years left till the very last mark when Mashiach has to come. It's a fact. <laughs> but we still have that 219 years. It could happen earlier, but it hasn't happened in the last 3,000 years. So the scary part is the coming of Mashiach finally being revealed, or is it our wishful thinking at the moment? It is not wishful thinking, because it is time for Mashiach to come. Yes, there's a 6,000 year deadline, but there's also the promise that it will not go to the deadline. So if you believe in the deadline, because your grandmother told you, <laughs> then believe what else your grandmother told you, and that is that it's not going to go to the deadline. So, if it's not going to go to the deadline, we're pretty much out of time. Because to say the deadline is 6,000 6, years, but it'll come after 5,999, that's insignificant and meaningless. If it's going to be early, then it's now. In fact, it's not even early anymore. It's quite late. 200 years out of 3,000? No, that's not even early. So it is time, even in fact. So the fact and the truth are finally matching. The truth is Mashiach must come, and the fact is it's time. So it is not wishful thinking. And then if you look around and you see what's going on, not only is it not wishful thinking, it's happening in front of our eyes. This is where I want to concentrate on, because in one of your um, lectures um, in your YouTube channel, um, you said that you feel bad for those who are not seeing it. Rabbi Friedman, please help us see it. So we're all on the same page and we all can get enthusiastic and start really seeing what we need to be seeing right now. You know, there was that old joke about Jews being obsessed with Jewish issues. 
the price of sardines in Norway went up. Oh, is that good for Jews or not good for Jews? <laughs> <laughs> That's our only question. Are good for the Jews? No. Actually, that is the right question. If you want to know whether the world is getting better, the best measure is, is this good for Jews? Because when the world is bad, it's bad to the Jews. When the world is good, it'll be good for the Jews. That's history. History is the story of the Jews in a, in a, in a historical context. So, as we spoke, I think, two weeks ago, there used to be Stalin, now there's Putin. There used to be Roosevelt, now there's Trump. There used to be Churchill, now there's Johnson. Better for the Jews? <laughs> like, light years better. I don't even see that. I'm sorry, I have to put it out there. For as much good as he did for the land of Israel, of course he's good for the Jews, but a lot of Jews are still in denial over that, unfortunately. That's what I'm so upset about. <laughs> see, because they're looking at other things. They're not focusing... They don't want to be so parochial as to think only, is it good for the Jews? That sounds petty and it sounds tribalistic, but it's not. History repeats itself over and over again. When, when the world is, is healthy, it's good for the Jews. When it's not good for the Jews, it's not good for the world. So if you want a really true barometer Look at how the world is thinking or be behaving towards Jews. Has the world gotten better since World War II? Of Light years. Of and in the last couple of years, unbelievably. So keep your eye on what, what's happening with the Jews. You know, some people say the Jew is like the canary, the miner's canary. The miners go down into the into the uh, into the caves, and the air is poisonous. So they take a canary with them, and they watch. When the canary starts to fade, they know that the the gases or whatever it is are becoming too toxic, and it's time to leave, because the canary is more sensitive. So the Jews are like the canaries of the world. If you want to know whether the world is going bad. Look at, what's, look at how it's affecting the Jews. If it's threatening the Jews, then the world is being threatened. That's not why the Jews exist, as some people suggest. We exist to be their canaries. Of course not. But what is true is, when the world starts to go bad and it's still not obvious, look at how it's affecting the Jews. Like, you know, first they came for the Jews, now they're coming for you. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> some Jews are playing along. They're, and they're big players. I mean, let, let me name George Soros right there. He's a big player. This whole thing is not so bad for him. So, <laughs> yeah. It is, terribly, it is terribly bad for him. For him, it's the worst. Because again, we measure by morality, not by wealth or by political power, by morality. And it's very sad how far he's drifted from what a Jew is supposed to be. So uh, hopefully he'll be the first to do tshuva. He's got what to do tshuva for. <laughs> I'll be happy to see that, <laughs> as many of us will be. Yeah. But again, in history, every tragedy for the Jewish people began with Jewish people. We are, we are the best at getting ourselves into trouble. <laughs> so when are we going to learn? Tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. <laughs> and it's not that we're going to start learning. We've been learning, we just never, you know, like that aha moment. Mm -hmm.
that's all that has to happen. It's like, oh, oh, is that what you were saying? Oh, now I get it. But we've been saying it for 3,000 years. Only, you know, the world was saying things different and we got a little confused and didn't know who to listen to. And in our great humility, true, no, no, no sarcasm there, in our great humility, we assumed that everybody else was probably right and that we were wrong, which is wrong. <laughs> we were right all along. And the world is starting to notice it in a big way. The world is looking to Jews to see what's going on, what's real, what's not. How are, how are Jews handling this? The world is noticing, which is a good thing. Well, hopefully that good things just will become better and better and better. So the whole world gets healthy again, which is the most important thing. Remember morally, morally first, mm -hmm. and then physically. I mean, Reverend Friedman, unfortunately, this is the last moments of our 2020 um, Thank God It's Tuesday show. And thank God for that. <laughs> 2020 <laughs> being over. <laughs> um, please, can we have some wor words of wisdom going into the new 2021? And I hope that the whole next year we'll be able to point out um, to everybody in where to look for, to find goodness and see the change and see the revelation of the coming of my sheikh, I hope. Because um, it's hard. It's hard when you're scared, but it's so necessary to be that positive force. So I hope uh, we will continue doing that um, at least on Tuesdays in the upcoming year. You know, I would go fishing in the rivers uh, on the border with Canada. And I noticed that every time I go out on the boat, I get, I get headaches. I couldn't imagine why. I didn't get nauseous. <laughs> the waves were not that big. Why the headache? And then I realized I get a headache from looking out at the endless water because there's nothing to focus on. When I look back down at the boat, the headache goes away. The moral of the story is, you look at the world in vague, undefined terms, and it gives you a headache, because you don't see. Focus on your own boat, the boat that you're in, and, and, and the headache goes away. So in this week's Torah reading, Jacob comes down to Egypt, he discovers Yosef is still alive, and that Yosef has two children who are, who are tzaddikim. They are loyal to Yaakov's teachings and Yaakov's beliefs and Yaakov's values. And Yaakov says, these children, they are mine. And the Hebrew wording can also be read they are me, or now I am me. Because if you want to know whether you're absolutely sincere and true and strong, look at your grandchildren. When your children follow in your path, good, but not so impressive because after all, they're your children. You are their role model. But when the third generation, when your grandchildren are following and are being good the way you taught and the way you believed, now you know that who you are is real. Which is interesting because Jacob was also the third generation. He was Abraham's grandson. But he didn't give himself that credit. He wasn't sure about himself until he saw his grandchildren. So instead of looking at the world and getting dizzy, because you're not sure what to focus on, bring it closer to home. Focus on your grandchildren. What values can you teach them? 
What goodness can you expect of them? What's your message to them? All of a sudden things become focused. More so than with your own children. Like you ask someone, what do you want your grandchildren to think of you? Whoa, that's a sobering thought. <laughs> Ugh, that's like, how do you want them to remember you? What do they think of you? Oh, that goes right, right to the jugular. So let's do that. Let's focus in, not out. It's not petty. The other stuff is petty. So as the world becomes better cosmically, let's, let's focus on our own little world and make it better personally. So look at what your grandchildren are seeing. What are they hearing from you? And what do you want them to hear? That's sobering. That's 2020 vision. Wow. Thank you so much, Rabbi Friedman. Thank you for every single Tuesday you have given us in, a, in the year 2020, which helped us be more sober and clear about the times we're living in. And of course, something that makes us as better as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> now that we're so sober, we should say Lachayim and get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> uh, again, thank you so much. And um, I know it's a calendar year, but still happy 2021. It's a fiscal year, so may it be very successful for you, your family, and everything that you're doing for the world, which is amazing. And uh, Amen. Please keep doing it. Thank you so much. Amen to that. Be well. You too. Thank you so much.